see I'm hitting the record button. So uh, tonight we got Dave Schneider presenting some of his research on some of the locomotives that he developed when he was uh, uh, building his SMR organization. And uh, so we'll go as far as we go and please feel free to ask questions. And I'd turn it over to you, Dave. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Uh, before I start, uh, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about how I, I set this up. Uh, basically, uh, we're going to be looking in, in some detail on two different locomotives, one which I actually built a model of and one in which I was actually doing actively researching prior to. But what I want to do is really cover some of the basic techniques of doing research and give you some advice on how to uh, work things out because uh, there's a lot of uh, mysterious uh, knowledge that's out there uh, at very, uh, you have to be part of the elect and, you know, wave the secret, secret uh, password or whatever it is. But uh, hopefully this will help you guys. Uh, it's, it's geared a little bit towards uh, presuming that, that you know something about trains, but not a hell of a lot. Uh, if you are uh, more advanced like uh, Bernie over there, uh, you probably uh, can snooze. Uh, all right, but in any case, uh, this is a, uh, a, uh, a, power, a PowerPoint that I'm going to do, and I'm going to share this with you uh, guys, and um, let's see how it looks. Uh, I don't know if it came up or not, but uh, tell me, do you see something that says researching 19th century locomotives? Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. yes. Excellent. All right. Well, let me get that. let me get that slideshow running, and we'll be ready to go. Rock and roll. Okay. This is a, a, a nice little diorama of uh, a very famous scene that many of you have seen uh, in in, uh, in Abdul's book and many other books of uh, showing General Hop uh, of supervising while they were clearing a uh, a cut, uh, but. Uh, Basically, uh, the, the thing about researching engines is, is that it's, it's really oftentimes hit or miss or just simply having a strong memory as to where you once upon a time saw something. Uh, the other thing is the key that what you're going to be looking for is uh, as high a res uh, that you can get. Uh, with wet plate uh, photography, you can get unbelievably uh, high resolution uh, when you are searching at this. Uh, I recall when I was uh, looking at this particular uh, uh, photograph uh, of the original, uh, it was possible because of the high resolution in the TIFF file uh, to actually see the handprints in the dust on the back of the tender and the fact that there was a, a, a uh, oil can sitting on top of the boiler in uh, backhead inside of the cab. And this sort of thing that you can zoom into is just mind boggling. But that's the key to really finding the details. If you uh, stick to books that are published, you'll never be able to do it because you'll run into the dots. Uh, because uh, wet plate technology does not use uh, dots in re reproducing photographs, uh, you can expand it to uh, levels that you normally cannot even hope to get to. And that's what you really need to do. But what are the problems that you face when you are uh, trying to uh, research a locomotive? Well, the obvious ones, lack of documentation. That's the number one thing. Finding documentation on the things is like pulling teeth. The fact that there are no blueprints often or detailed dimensional data. If you get dimensional data, oof, hook onto it. Uh, but reality is, is that uh, in many cases, you don't ever find that there are uh, slightly out of the way places where you can look for such things. There are uh, sets of drawings that were done uh, by different uh, uh, craftsmen. There are also, for example, um, uh, the 1869 uh, 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 Builders Encyclopedia, Car Builders Encyclopedia, is a marvelous resource for accurate scale drawings of all sorts of accessories, parts, and cars. Uh, and because it was uh, published in 1869, uh, it really is uh, almost uh, completely uh, acceptable for late Civil War period also. Uh, the other problem is, of course, limited or no contemporary 
uh, photos or drawings. Um, the uh, photos are a big problem. Uh, there are ways to get around that, but uh, you're, it's very rare to be able to get certain types of shots. Most of your shots tend to be straight on side shots, almost always engineer side. It's very difficult to get a fireman's side. It's very difficult to get certain angles. I remember uh, the unbelievable relevation that I had when I was suddenly discovered that in the, uh, the uh, Russell uh, photographs of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, he actually set his camera on top of a cab of a locomotive and took a shot looking forward. Well, coincidentally, the, the locomotive he did it with was a Mason engine of the same class of the Mason engines I was looking to uh, reproduce. So I actually got to see what the top down view of the boiler is, which is like almost never able to get. Uh, the other problem is uh, there are a lot of misconceptions and errors all over the place. Uh, the books that were written over the years, uh, many of them are uh, were researched to the best of the ability of the author at the time. But since that time, there is far more information that has been found and cataloged and things like that. I remember the very first time that I went to the National Archives to look at the Civil War uh, photograph collection, which I did in uh, 1976. Uh, it was all on uh, microfish uh, tape reels, and it was not cataloged except by numbers. And I literally through like about 2000 photographs to look for stuff that I was wanted to wanted to see. So uh, sometimes you just have to dig and dig and dig. And a lot of times searching the search function doesn't get you where you want to go. And of course, the biggest problem of all color, how do you find it in the black and white wet plate world? We're going to discuss that. Now your basic sources, most of you are aware of this. Sometimes they're a total gold mine and so other times they're completely worthless. The National Archives is hard to search. If you use the National Archives search function, you're gonna go nuts because it will not call up the stuff that you think it should because you didn't use precisely the same exact search function that they wanted you to use. Uh, what I've done literally is spent huge numbers of hours flipping through them without search. I just go to the whole, the whole nine yards and flip through them. And I found all kinds of fascinating stuff that way. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of uh, college collections. Uh, if, if you want to say something, anybody just go ahead and holler because otherwise I'll rock and roll. Okay. Uh, their colleges have great collections of stuff. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Southern Methodist College down in, uh, in Texas uh, happens to have one of the biggest collections of Baldwin uh, records. Uh, they scooped them up and uh, were able to put them together. It's hard to search it, but you can get things. Uh, one of the ways that I found out uh, the color schemes for my Baldwin uh, locomotives that I did, the, uh, the, the uh, moguls, uh, well, the order sheet was there and I was able to get a copy of the order sheet which specified the exact paint scheme used. Likewise, they have uh, other things. Later on engines, they actually have blueprints on. When I was considering making the uh, a plane compound uh, camelback engine of the 1890s, uh, I got a set of uh, the drawings, the ball, original ball and the drawings uh, of this locomotive and I actually it had, had every intention of making it, but you know, shit happens. Uh, museums are uh, very greatly. Sometimes they have good collections, sometimes they don't. Uh, their staff is really what tells you this detail because sometimes the staff is really, really good and really will go out of their way and they're really familiar with their, their, uh, with their items and sometimes they aren't. Uh, it isn't always where you expect to find the material. For example, the uh, library of the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania has a fantastic collection of photographs of every railroad, not just the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, for a wide range. And the, uh, the uh, archivist there is familiar with the collection and will help you, uh, when you if you ask him what to, uh, you were looking for. Hmm. O Museum, 
uh, I've had mixed results. I had run-ins with uh, the guy who was at the time the curator who did, was not interested in, in, in riffraff companies that were making models of trains, whereas the archivist was really, really interested and gave me copies of some really rare photographs, including uh, the William Mason in its uh, number 25, originally as delivered a uh, photograph, which I didn't even know existed. Uh, but it's a crapshoot, and and you could if you talk to the wrong person on the wrong day, uh, you ain't going to find out anything. So sometimes you got to ask more than once, or you got to get the names of the people there and uh, call when they're working. Uh, secondary sources; those are published works, of course, uh, but a lot of them just are copying other people's work, and they just repeat it over and over again. Uh, I like to advise people not to trust Edwin Alexander. I found him wrong so many times that I hardly even glance at his book anymore. Uh, the Civil War Tactics book that was put out uh, by uh, uh, whatever the name was of the company there, the series. Um, in any case, that's garbage, utter garbage. It was Osprey. Osprey, yeah. yeah. I got a lot of Osprey books because I used to do a lot of Napoleonic miniatures and stuff, and they were good for uniforms, but that Civil War Tactics book of theirs is literally horrible. I, it, it's totally, it's plagiarized crap. His drawings are, are crazy, and uh, I, I bitterly regret the, the money I wasted on it. But there are a lot of others that are also so-so uh, as well. And uh, I can't even, like I said, can't even begin to list them here because uh, it's just years and years of stuff. But I suggest if you're looking up serious stuff, your go-to guy is John H. White Jr. He is the guy who used to work at the uh, at, at uh, the Smithsonian. Uh, he was really passionate about railroads, and he had his fingers into resources that other people only dream of. And if you've got a book by him, uh, and there are several really good ones. Here's the basic one on the uh, American locomotives, uh, which goes into each each type of, 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 uh, of uh, section by section, you know, boilers, uh, tenders, uh, other equipment. Then they have uh, chapters of individual locomotives that are extremely good. Uh, Alan Stoffer did a lot of good work, but his work was always railroad specific. But I would find uh, all sorts of information regarding the rosters and stuff like that there. Uh, Snowden Bell is an old-time writer who wrote in the 1800s. Uh, his stories and information about the B&O Railroad is a very good. And uh, I think it was, what, a week or two ago? A couple weeks ago, uh, somebody was talking about the engine, uh, the Lady Davis, okay? Well, Bell actually covers the Lady Davis because that engine that was uh, originally a B&O uh, uh, engine that was stolen uh, from during the, uh, the great raid there on Harper's Ferry, and then it was sent over and repainted with this uh, elegant black uh, uh, paint job and named the Lady Davis. So if you want to know uh, what it really looked like and need information, all you have to do is research the uh, earlier Masons, such as the uh, William Mason in uh, the b &O Railroad, and you're going to know what it looks like. Uh, now, Abdul is a book that everybody starts with, and I started with it, and almost everybody has it that I've ever talked to. It's a good, it's a good starting point, but most of his text information is extremely suspect, and uh, he makes lots of mistakes. And uh, his photographs, uh, well, there, there are three editions of Abdul. One is the original, the other was a paperback, and the third one was the more recent uh, hardcover. And... Uh, Interestingly enough, the paperback seemed to have the best uh, quality of the photograph reproduction, but the trouble is all of them are, uh, you know, just prints. And what's more important is, is when he credits where he got it from, because then if you take, you go and start searching for that photograph in the National Archives and you can get a hold of that TIFF file, then bingo, you're going to find some information. I've got a couple examples of this uh, upcoming in the, in the, uh, uh, illustrations in, of this uh, uh, this talk. Uh, now, James Bogle was an interesting character, and his most well-known uh, book was The General and the Texas, but it was really 
oddly written in that it was a put together of different sor sources. He made photocopies of this and that, slammed it into the book. Uh, but what it was useful for, I found, was uh, mostly uh, the information about that he had individual raiders, photographs that, that were hard to find. Uh, he had uh, a couple of other accounts about the general afterwards, uh, like the co big collision that it had later on and, and things like that that was in there. And I thought that was very useful. He also wrote a short monograph that I haven't seen anywhere. He gave me a copy personally, uh, but I've never seen it for sale anywhere on the Texas itself. And uh, that, in, that, you know, it's just something, I don't know where you'll ever find it. Somebody's got to have a few copies. I mean, he made some, but I just have the one. Uh, the uh, Locomotives of Pennsylvania Railroad was put out by the, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad pe uh, Society people. And uh, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get now. Originally it was, I used to sell them, uh, but uh, as far as I know, they're very, they've, they've like doubled in price or tripled in price but it does have some really excellent drawings and some very good information. There's some information there, of course, there, nobody's perfect. I make mistakes, they make mistakes. Uh, but I remember though, he was at that, that book was able to guide me over to Harrisburg where I got to actually read through all of the uh, notebooks by the various uh, uh, supervisors of uh, Altoona Works, which was really useful for me uh, when I was making the, uh, Pennsylvania uh, uh, D6 class locomotives. Uh, it doesn't really go flat far back into the Civil War, but uh, if you're doing some of the 1880s, it's a very valuable uh, resource. Now online, if you're not aware of this particular website uh, put out by Thomas Tabor, uh, the Antebellum Railroads uh, website, it's uh, online. It's part of the uh, Railroad Historical Society, uh, H RHS. Dot org, okay. Uh, if you have uh, something to write notes with, write this down. This is amazing. It's 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 difficult to read because it's another slap together of a lot of uh, Xerox stuff. The photographs are just so so, uh, but there are lots and lots of them. What's really important is the rosters and the list of the railroads. And if you're thinking about a railroad to uh, to build and you're not building the Western Atlantic and you're not building the US Military Railroad or whatever, and you wanna build some, some New England little road that's 51 miles or something like that from Boston to wherever, or you wanna do something in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, or if you wanna do something in uh, Tennessee, he's got really good details, every station listed, things like that. Uh, it's very useful. But again, it's difficult to go through because it's not indexed except by state. You simply have to go through it page by page. Within each state, it's alphabetical. But if you're just browsing or if you're looking for something specific, uh, you're gonna have a hard time. Like uh, when I was preparing this particular uh, talk, uh, I was uh, searching for, uh, to confirm a certain, whether certain locomotives, which ones were actually uh, in the uh, in Alexandria during the war that they obtained from uh, a railroad. Now, uh, Alexander lists, uh, uh, I think, three, and uh, Amdell lists like six, and Tabor has a very specific exactly which engines, and it's like four. So you get who, who's right? Well, in this particular case, I think Tabor is more accurate. So if you guys want to write this one down, it will be really, um, you'll enjoy spending hours looking through this. So what other information exists? Well, there's builder's data, but builder's data is very often very poor because of lost documents. That's the real problem. Sometimes the general uh, list of, of, of numbers is available and you'll know the construction number such and such was this locomotive or whatever, but rarely there's detail. Uh, one of the great finds I'll tell you about in a little while was dealt with the Yona, okay? But um, basically uh, it's mostly good for locating all the sisters that exist, which then widens your search for uh, photographs because you can then use sister photographs 
instead of uh, the impossibility of finding the one locomotive that you're looking for. Uh, now, of course, photos in general uh, exist, uh, and it's just this is just a basic list. But the problem is, is that some of the photos are going to show uh, modifications or rebuilds or something like that. Uh, when I was looking for a particular locomotive, I found a photograph of that a hospital did, and then I realized, oh no, this engine was completely worked over and barely looks like the original, and so I'd wasted my time. Uh, paintings, be careful about paintings. Uh, remember, a painting is what the artist sees in his head. It isn't what it actually looks like. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. And of course, there's other media, lithographs, drawings, descriptions, etc. But the lithographs are usually distorted uh, depending on what the advertiser, the guy who paid for the lithograph, wants to show off. Uh, so you get funny looking ones where you have miniature guys that are about two feet high sticking their head out of the cab, which looks gigantic, and that throws your scales off, or sometimes they emphasize some other feature, and so it's very difficult to get a size. How do you size a locomotive? Well, the ideal thing is to uh, get a good fo side photograph and then note what, you know, find the, uh, the builder data as to what the size of the driver was that then becomes your scale. You then measure everything based on the size of the driver. And that gives you your basic, and you'll be within a couple of inches. Uh, and then of course, there's other sources of the museums, as I mentioned, secondaries that I mentioned. And last but not least, rumor and luck. There have been times that I have uh, found stuff just simply because somebody said that somebody said that they thought they thought that this was here. And sometimes I just simply popped up, just popped up and said, holy shit. <laughs> Let's talk about Builder Dev. We're going to talk about specifically uh, what I did to uh, design the Yona. Okay. Uh, the Yona was, of course, uh, the third engine I did of the, of the great locomotive chase, and uh, it was uh, the hardest one to find really good information because it was an old engine and it was uh, not well treated and it ended its days in, uh, uh, in obscurity. And so uh, there was never any photographs I could find as Yona. Uh, there was, of course, the one photograph of the Atlanta Yards, uh, which uh, looked like it you know, might have been the Yona, but in reality, uh, I identified that as a Norris engine. I forget the exact name, but they also had a Norris engine about that age, and that's that one. And it was uh, the 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 uh, front of the uh, the, uh, the smoke box door, which sort of like threw threw that out. Right. Uh, but what you what what I'd started with, of course, was going to my handy dandy list of all Rogers locomotives. There's a guy who some years ago uh, published a, uh, a CD uh, with data on it with uh, builders lists that have been put together over the years of uh, multiple uh, railroads, uh, uh, Cook, uh, Rogers, uh, several others. Okay, and that allows you to see the the build date and the build number, and it always has very limited configuration. In other words, it basically all it says is it has four drivers, 60 inches. Okay, great. That's that's no not a particularly good way to start if you're trying to build a locomotive by knowing, yeah, it's, okay, it's a 440 and the drivers are 60 inches. Okay, fantastic. So are there any direct photos of the Yona? As far as I have ever been able to determine, and I've spoken to everybody, including uh, Colonel Bogle, Answer is no, there are no pictures of the Yona, but there are sister photos. And when I first wrote this uh, just a few days ago, I said, no, there's one only, the New York and Harlem Railroad's engine, Armenia, Armenia which was uh, build number uh, 242 and built uh, two years later, over two, two and a half years later, uh, but I'm wrong. While uh, redoing work for uh, when I was looking up the, uh, uh, the question about just how many of these particular engines uh, from the Fitchburg Railroad got to uh, the US Military Railroad, lo and behold, while flipping through Mass uh, the Connecticut uh, lists of uh, railroads and stuff, 
I found another photograph of a sister engine of the Yona. And I said, damn, wish I had seen that before. Not that it would have made any difference because it looked just like the photo of the Amenia, but uh, at the same time, uh, more data is always good. So even now, uh, you can run into stuff totally by accident, uh, and it's just simply uh, OMG a moment. Now this is the uh, photograph of the Amenia. That uh, only difference is the uh, driver size. And there, this is a standard of uh, this engine looks very much like the lithograph of the period. Uh, it has many of the features that uh, are standard within Rogers. This is a standard Rogers product of the time. And uh, this is uh, what was used primarily, as you'll see, when we look at uh, some of the other people's drawings, the Kurtz uh, painting and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the drawing of uh, uh, the Alexander's drawing of the Yona used this photograph. And this photograph is not what the Yona looked like. There were significant differences and you'll see what I mean in a moment. That front piston, what's sitting on top of it? What's that Steam now? Test. The thing on top of that front piston. That you did. Top of the piston, the box? Yeah, like a bunch of yeah, that's just, Yeah, that's the seam test. test. That's the, the valves. Huh. OK. OK, there's a better. You'll see a drawing in a minute. Might okay. answer your question, OK? Okay. Okay. So let's move on here. Uh, so the painting of the Yona was done by Wilbur Kurtz. Wilbur Kurtz was kind of famous. He did lots of uh, pictures of the great locomotive chase. He was obsessed with it. Uh, it could be because he married Fuller's daughter. Uh, he also, uh, you know, and listened to, he, he, he got Fuller's full uh, uh, account, but he also interviewed many of the surviving raiders at the time. And he specialized in civil war art. And uh, he did a whole series of paintings. Uh, many of them sort of consider them authoritative, but there's a lot of people who dispute that as well. Uh, one of his problems is, is he had a uh, tendency as an artist to prefer a uh, yellow uh, ochre style of uh, atmosphere, which uh, distorts the colors of the engines because uh, the, the lighting effect of his, of his artwork. Uh, this is the picture of Yona according to uh, Kurt. Now, this engine differs from the Amenia photograph because it has the Radley and Hunter uh, slightly larger uh, stack. It has the standard Western and Atlantic uh, uh, pilot, which was made out of uh, leftover scraps from the strap rail. And uh, this was unique to uh, them. They uh, made all of the, they ordered all of their locomotives apparently without pilots and then added the, uh, the, the, them themselves. So the Amenia has the Rogers pilot, which is a boiler tube style. And this is a strap rail style. It also has this peculiar, and I never could understand why, uh, uh, the uh, uh, platform for the headlight is like skewed out of place, like somebody bashed it or something, and there is no headlight there. I don't know why that would be the case. Uh, but uh, basically, though, uh, when you uh, compare this engine to the Amenia, the fact is, is that he copied this painting from the photograph of the Amenia because the drivers are a little too tall. Uh, they don't look like 60 inches when you look at the man next to it and the track, you know, add the extra couple of inches for the ties. Uh, that guy is, uh, is like five foot two uh, with a top hat on. I don't sort of buy that. But nevertheless, uh, it does give the uh, green cab color, uh, which is very typical Rogers of the time. And uh, it just shows some of the brass, but it also has a major uh, error in it that has been repeated in every drawing of the owner that I've ever seen, which I'll tell you about in a minute. This is the lithograph of the, of the locomotive victory, which was the prototype of the uh, Yona. And uh, this has, again, the narrower uh, stack and the, uh, the uh, boiler uh, tube uh, style of uh, pilot that you see in the Minya photograph. 
Uh, this also has the uh, guy in the cab who is about uh, 18 <laughs> high. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's really silly. But it does have certain details that are marvelous for uh, figuring out. It also has the weirdest headlight I ever saw. Yeah. But it has a, has a uh, detail that, that is rarely seen. And I wound up incorporating that into the, directly into the model. And that is the hubcaps, which I thought was really cool. And so uh, my builder was able to do some micro printing and, and we added those hubcaps. Wow. So, uh, and there you can see perhaps uh, this answers your, uh, your question regarding the, uh, regarding the, uh, the steam chest. Yeah. And this is a typical outside frame engine at the time. So, you know, you got the outside frame too. Okay, so here you go. There's the picture of the Munia. There's the picture of the Victory. The Victory is much older, but as you can see, they continue to build the exact same style of locomotive. There's a slight difference in the window arrangement in the cab. Uh, there's, a, you know, of course, a large box uh, headlight. Uh, the stack is a little, is very similar. Uh, the, the pilot is similar. Notice how tall the uh, guy is standing on the on the pilot on the on the on the uh, uh, the bar there. Um, and then you look at the size of the guy in the cab. Uh, that's why I said that guy in the cab is about 18 inches as high. Now there are other drawings too of this lithograph in the 1876 Rogers catalog, which has been reprinted, and you can get this every now and then. It shows up. Uh, this is their drawing, and it's very nice because it does show uh, some better detail that, you, that gets obscured in the, uh, in the lithograph. But if you notice, it doesn't have those really cool hubcaps, and I was determined to do that. <laughs> in any case, uh, though, and it, it does show the arrangements with the, the release there for the, uh, the sandbox and the, the pipeline in the sandbox very clearly delineated, and also the... Uh, the water, uh, the water pump arrangement and all of that. So it was very useful, but what was even more interesting because the- young David, hmm? a question. Sure. Uh, the, uh, the headlight on this drawing, is that, is that a headlight, headlamp? What was that now? Is that a headlamp what on a, this drawing? In the front, right? Yeah. yeah. Some kind of ridiculously small uh, headlamp. That's what I made the comment. See, there it is in the lithograph. Now, I've never seen one that small on a little bar like that. But uh, again, you know, uh, the artist of the lithograph sometimes is uh, a little bit odd. They, they, they do things out of scale and whatever. But what was more interesting, as I was starting to say, is that in the Yona model, I had decided to make the... Uh, eccentrics and such movable. And that makes it very difficult when you just have this sort of, uh, of uh, drawing. How do you even see what they look like? Well, uh, that self-same, and the reason I was able to do it, self-same uh, Rogers catalog, uh, it had drawings of different linkages, including the 1849 uh, adjustable valve gear that Rogers used. It was uh, a modification of the Stevenson system. And, uh, and it shows, you know, the valves and how it works and, and the different linkages and whatever. And I was able to then incorporate this right into the model because this would be the appropriate one. Sometimes it's practically a blueprint. There's no weight, no sizes though. So I'm still left with trying to measure sizes, but it is uh, very accurately drawn. This was a marvelous find as well. And you wouldn't expect to find information for 1849-50 locomotive in a catalog of 1876. It's not because they were still selling these things, it's because they decided to add a whole section of history. And so there's a lot of information on early Rogers engines in that catalog. Now, Sometimes drawings are less useful. Now, this is the drawing from Alexander's Civil War uh, book, okay? 
Many of you probably have that. And once again, what he's done here is he shows Yona with a standard Bradley Hunter, which was uh, what Atlantic, the Western Atlantic did. And it shows the standard Western Atlantic pilot made with uh, the bars from uh, the uh, strap rail, the used strap rail. Uh, but uh, basically, however, uh, he doesn't have the, uh, the name of the company on the fenders and things like that, that all the company information shows uh, where it's spelled out, Rogers, Ketchum, and Grossvener, or Patterson, New Jersey. He just has the little later style R, K, and G thing between the wheels. Now, why that is, I don't know. He also repeats the, uh, the great error, which we're going to uh, discuss in a few moments because he based this once again on the Amenia photograph and probably on the 1876 drawing or the lithograph. He also has an eight wheel tender. The Amenia shows an eight wheel tender, but yet there was constant rumors of a six wheel tender. And so even Alexander went ahead and decided in addition to the eight wheel tender, he would draw a six wheel tender. And this is a, a correct style uh, uh, Rogers uh, six wheel tender. Uh, this is the same style that is shown in uh, White's book on, the, on American locomotives. Uh, there isn't a section on the Yona, but they have a section on tenders and in it they show the Rogers tender with the, uh, the truck, the, the four wheel truck in the back and the larger size wheel in the front. So the question still was though, is that going to be, uh, which tender is it? I mean, what tender was on the, on the locomotive? Was it an eight wheel tender? Was it a six wheel tender? What kind of thing? Whatever it is. Well, that's where rumor and luck comes in. And sometimes it's who you know. Sometimes it's a referral, but you gotta always ask people questions because they are willing to answer. They wanna share their information so you can do it. And, you know, a little smart ass thing is, yeah, it is like a lottery. If you don't play, you don't win. Uh, you gotta ask. Uh, so what happens is, it so happens that at the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum, one of their staff is an utter buff of uh, the West of the Rogers and also the Civil War and of the General and all the other engines. He's also a, a locomotive engineer for the uh, Strasburg Railroad and all of that. And uh, he's a really remarkable fellow. And he just knew where stuff was that I had no idea even existed. And so when I told him I wanted to build the Yona, he suddenly sends me a photocopy of a page from the original Rogers order book ledger from 1849 that details all of the specifications and the changes made in the Yona. And this is an excerpt of the relevant parts of that. Much of it was minor piping changes and things like that. However, in this book, it lists right here as according to letters that were sent by the uh, Western Atlantic on September 16th and uh, and their response on September 25th. By the way, mail, mail went a lot faster in the 1800s than it does today. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, the basic order for you was to build one passenger engine to be the fellow of the Monterey. The Monterey was considered to be the, the class leader of, the, of this class, and so that's what they mean by fellow of with the following alterations. And then there was a list of all these various alterations. Most of them were certain types of uh, changes in specifications for boiler tubes, things like that, that would never be seen. However, right there, number six, dispense with the safety valve on the boiler, the one on the dome being sufficient. That's the Canon style safety valve. Let me jump backwards, right there, see it? Right between the bell and the uh, sandbox is this gigantic safety valve oh. photograph. It's in the uh, painting. It's in the Amenia photograph. Right. It's in, uh, in Alexander's book. Okay. But here you got it in black and white. <coughs> Item number six, eliminate it. So it wasn't delivered with a safety valve on the boiler. The mm -hmm. cat wasn't there. And that changes the whole profile of the locomotive. Next was further down. 
tender, same as Monterey's, of six wheels. Question answered. The Yonas tender was a six wheel tender. Right. Good. There it is, deliverable on that date, twice, over, including house over the footboard, meaning the cab, and importantly, patent fee on a rester. In other words, the Radley and Hunter uh, uh, stack was added at the factory and they had to pay the patent fee uh, through there. The, the price of the locomotive was $6,200. And there it is listed, name of engine, Yoda. Okay, so amazing. When I got question, Dave. I already ordered eight wheel tenders for this model. Dave, quick question. Yes. It says there, uh, uh, what was that? Uh, price including house over the blah, blah. So right. do you have any idea when the term cab came into the lexicon? No, I don't. Um, it just seems to have floated in somewhere because um, you'll see even into the 50s, at least 1850s, they still talk about it as being over the footboard and the fact that there were some railroads that still actually got engines in the 1850s that didn't have a cab. But uh, it's just a, a stylistic change. But uh, in 18 so they would refer to it as the house. Yes, a house. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was a house. Thank you. In any case, uh, yeah. So, so all kinds of interesting stuff that you find out. But I would have never found this. I didn't know this existed. As far as I knew, uh, Patterson, uh, the Rogers uh, order books were mostly all destroyed in a, in a fire, but apparently not the one that covered this engine. And there it was, there's a difference. Okay, so uh, I was starting to say that I'd actually ordered the model because this came in late. Um, and I had already done the design work. We had already contracted it. The builder was already building eight wheel tenders. I had to tell him uh, to stop the press uh, delayed the, 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 the entire production run for about four months and redesigned it as a six wheel tender. It cost me a ton of money, uh, but you know, that's just the way I ran my business. I, if I, if I know it's wrong, I ain't going to do it. And this is the picture of the finished product. And if you notice, guess what? There's no uh, safety valve <clears throat> between that whistle on its stem and the, uh, the uh, uh, sandbox. Right. Furthermore, there's a little blow up of the wheels. It shows the full name, Rogers Ketchum and Grosvenor, right. uh, New Jersey, and it has the wheel covers, which I just had to have. Trivia question again for you, Dave. Um, sure. do, you, do you know the origin of the word Yona? Yes, it's a Cherokee word means bear. Really? Because I heard that it was, and I don't know how this happened, but it is the English translation of the Hebrew word Jonah, which means dove. Nope. Bear. Yep. Love I've it. That on, I've seen that in, 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 in some significant documentation. Uh, and, uh, you yeah, know, it's the Cherokee word for bear. Thank you. Okay. So there's a, a, a completed model. Okay, the paint job is, is a standard Rogers green. They favored green. Green was really popular in the 1850s. No. Uh, colors do change, uh, just like wine and reds and burgundies were very popular in the 1860s. In 1850, the colors were green. And so uh, even Kurt shows it as a green uh, color. So I was pretty on pretty safe ground uh, painting those sections in green. Right. Boiler is Russia iron. Uh, or should, and the course of firebox is just the black uh, 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 sort of a uh, what do you call it? graphite because there's no paint that will stand up to the heat. Okay. Is something I had a dispute with at one point with our friends over at uh, one of the museums, who shall be named unnamed, uh, about their insistence on putting these colored stripes around the tops of the stacks, and I said that would last exactly one run. The drawing shows that it has this. I says, yeah, okay, but the paints can't handle any kind of heat. And you know that the stack's gonna get really, really hot. The, the, there was one, hmm? one passage I read, it might've been in train running for the Confederacy where 
he described one train as having the the top of the dome painted red as a hospital train. Now I have no idea. I, I've seen that too, uh, but uh, I just can't imagine that it would last very long. They must have had to repaint it like every other day or something, because <laughs> these paints of, of this era, there is none uh, that lasts in the heat. That's why you have Russian iron on the boiler. It was just uh, there to try to protect, uh, you know, the the the, the metal. It's a metal treatment. It's like gun bluing. Gun bluing is very heat resistant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's been my experience on that. Right. Okay, so let's now talk about a, a, another type of locomotive altogether that I was actually in the process of uh, negotiating a, a, a build contract on uh, when the company folded up on me. Uh, and uh, that was uh, quite a disaster that I don't like to talk about. However, this is a really cool engine. This is the Soother uh, 440. John Soother was a builder in Massachusetts. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, the head of the Globe Locomotive Works. And I had started researching this for a couple of major reasons. Uh, one of them was the fact that John Soother not only built engines in New England, where uh, quite a few of them were sold, he also had engines that were wound up in the US Military Railroad but furthermore, he was the guy who was contracted by the Tredegar Oil Iron Works in Richmond to come down and set up their locomotive works. And for a couple of years, he actually stayed in Richmond uh, in the 1850s building locomotives. And he used precisely the same design uh, over and over and over again. Now this particular engine, the Elephant, this is a drawing taken from uh, John White's book uh, oh, also, it's an inside connected engine, and I hadn't done an inside connected engine. I really wanted to do one, so uh, that was the other thing. Now, this engine here, the Elephant, is a late 1840s engine. Uh, it still has a, it has an early style cab, what I call a New England style cab, because it has very small windows because it's cold in New England. Right. And uh, this, however, wound up getting shipped around the Cape Horn in a, sh in a uh, sailing uh, ship, and it was the very first locomotive to ever operate in California. So um, I thought that that would be interesting. But this is the drawing that is in, that, that John White did of the Soother engine. Now, take a look at this engine. Now this engine is uh, also shown uh, in Abdul on, uh, let's see if I have the page number here. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, 160, on page 160. However, uh, in uh, White's book is this photograph, which is of a significantly better quality. And that's on page 464 in, in White's book. Uh, so, but basically uh, what's critical is, look at this engine. It's exactly the same, which lines up perfectly with John Soother's method of thinking, which is, I've designed a locomotive. I'm going to build that same locomotive from now on, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> because he almost never changes the design of his engine. He has a few peculiarities that stand out and lets you spot a Soother engine like right away. One is that really odd placement of his steam dome. The steam dome is all the way up front next to the stack there. That's amazing. Uh, he uses the typical cannon uh, uh, style uh, safety valves, but that does vary. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two. Uh, he keeps a uh, outside frame for much longer than most other builders, but eventually goes to a dot outside frame. But if you notice the, uh, the steam chest up there or the inside cylinder, it's round. Mm -hmm. That is unique. I've not found anyone else who does that. And in fact, uh, White comments on that as well, uh, is his unique round steam chests. And the, uh, that, that, that sort of front, uh, the, the, the front of the smoke box with that, that crisscross kind of uh, uh, embellishment on the casting is also something that I've seen on, on numerous uh, models of this engine. Now, uh, so therefore, this sort of was a perfect 
model for SMR to build because it allows me to legitimately uh, use pretty much the same design for both uh, the North and the South and be totally authentic about it, which is a very difficult thing to do. Yes. Uh, up in it. Uh, on Walter? Two, on what's that? Two, on the front two wheels, it looks like the, the, the back one has a hubcap and the front one's plain. Right, right. That's, that's it's not uncommon to uh, to see that sort of thing happen. Uh, yeah. You some damage to a wheel and they replace it. The one with the hubcap is almost certainly the original the original one, and the one in front is probably a replacement or has been removed, or the hubcap simply fell off or or whatever. But uh, yeah, I've seen that in in, in several engines uh, scattered around this the, the disappearing hubcap thing. Dave, one more question. You you probably yeah. mentioned this. Um, the the pilot that's that you know chicken coop style which you said is primarily a southern railroads right well i didn't say it was primarily southern railroads i just said it was uh, uh frequently southern railroads i've only seen it in southern railroads but i don't have any proof basically that was what they did with some of the old strap rail right uh i have a uh a sister engine that i'm about to show you of a photograph uh, of one of the uh, Union engines uh, operating in, uh, in Alexandria. And you're gonna see that other than for a round uh, a headlight uh, casing, uh, it's exactly the same locomotive. Hmm. It's a pilot though, the pilot is a, a wood type uh, pilot. So uh, this is a, an interesting uh, uh, picture right here. Now what this is, was one of my random searches. This is not in any of the books. I found this yeah. by searching through the site of uh, looking at pictures of Alexandria. And this engine was way in the background and I blew this up tremendously. Oh. But if you look at it, this is the same engine. You can see the same style, the cannon uh, uh, safety valves. You can see the same domed screen over the, the stack. Uh -huh. you can see it appears to be the crisscross thing on the, the door to the uh, to the uh, smoke box, and uh, you can kind of make out the steam chest as being uh, sort of round with brass trim around it. And so uh, this is one of the engines that is, and it's also got the same kind of uh, of outside frame with the same kind of railings up there. Yeah. Wow. Is that the senator? What's that? The senator. I believe the loco is the senator. There's well, another I, shot I, of it from the back, uh, going through the tunnel, uh, up from the docks back up towards on the Orange and Alexandria line. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure about that because I haven't. You know, I never really searched even more. I have a couple of shots though. Yeah. Uh, they, what yeah I, I have. I, I had. I had seen this one and that one, and I think because it was used as uh, as one of the locos the that worked the harbor area. The right, area. exactly. Let me show you the same engine in the harbor. Now this is a picture out of uh, Abdul's book, okay? And uh, he mentions it's in the National Archives. So I looked and looked and looked and I found uh, a, a, a high-res TIF uh, uh, version and I blew this up. And here you can see the engine and you can even see the, the markings better and see how much clearer it is. Wow. And it, again, you can see there's the steam dome, exact same style, all the way up there by the by the stack. Uh, mm -hmm. This one apparently only has the one. Uh, it only that's right. The other one only had one. Also, uh, they both have only the one uh, safety valve. But uh, there, you can see the style of the uh, to tender. You can see some of the pinstripes. You can see the style of the, of the lettering. Uh, this is a, a really good picture. And again, you can confirm by the way the mechanism looks that this is definitely a Suther engine. And it looks very close to the, uh, to the engine, the Roanoke. All right. And then it's randomly hunting around more. And this is why I'm not sure which engine this is because I found another uh, dockyard picture with another engine, but it's a different one, but it's also the same class and the same builder. And there you have it. This one, definitely different. Uh, the uh, stack is different. 
This has the two uh, safety valves that's very typical. Yeah. So it has a round headlight. And it has the various railings and the outside frame. So I'm not sure if this is the one you're talking about going into the tunnel or whether the other one is the one going out the tunnel because there was definitely more than one soother engine in Alexandria. Wow. So uh, again, uh, this was a picture that was found in Abdil. And I then went to the archives and found a better quality picture, which I was then able to blow up much more. Wow. Amazing. And notice this guy's pilot's been removed and he's got a bar. Yep. It also seems to be in worse shape. Look at how some of the piping is bent from people properly yeah. standing on it. <laughs> yes. okay. Did so, Suter have the round headlamp? I've never. Yeah, the other one had the round headlamp too, which I thought right. was interesting. There, there, there are several locos with round headlamps in Alexandria. Yeah. yeah, that was probably put there by by the yard. Okay. But you notice that the stack doesn't have the domed screening either. Right. Okay. So this engine is, is definitely the same builder. It's built around the same time, a little bit earlier, probably because it only it has the two safeties and that was later reduced to one. Uh, it doesn't have the domed uh, screen over the uh, stack. Uh, but which one it is, as best as I can determine, I just cannot read the damn name if there is it looks like there might be some writing on the side of the cab but i can't make it out mm. and i never was able to so in any case this was part of a problem though uh now this does show the value of a general source uh you know by searching through that book i found where it was listed i saw the big photograph and it said courtesy of the national archives so i said okay it's got to be there and i just kept looking and looking until i did Right. Uh, the two photos that I just showed you was from page 48 and 49. Question on this tender. That probably is US MRR on the side, right? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It's, it's pretty clear. In fact, it seems the same style because there's a little bit of pinstriping around it visible, too. But what's different about this tender is the combing of the tender is actually up sweeps. Yeah. The other one was straight across. Yep. So that would make it's a unique, uh, somewhat unique model. I probably would not have made this particular engine, be, uh, but I might have if I thought people wanted it because this would be the same class as the Roanoke, but it would have a special tender and it starts raising costs and stuff like that. Right. But in any case, I would have made at least two engines and uh, it would have been nice to have, an, uh, you know, because the other engine, the Roanoke belongs to the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. And of course, this one's uh, working for the military railroad. So that's a, a really nice pair to have. This is a 1854 uh, lithograph of, uh, from the Globe Locomotive Works, Suther's Locomotive Works. And if you notice, he's abandoned the outside frame. He also only has one uh, safety valve, but he still has the same thing with the uh, steam dome all the way up in the front. So one safety valve indicates a somewhat newer engine. Uh, and if it somehow doesn't have, and I saw a couple other photographs of ones without the, uh, in that uh, uh, Antebellum Railroads book, uh, not, on, not book, but the online Antebellum Railroads uh, thing, uh, that showed more of these engines without the, the outside frame. But I felt that the two outside frame engines would be perfectly uh, reasonable and uh, very interesting. This also shows a very nice uh, shot there of the water pump system too. Yep. Across the, yep. the cross uh, bolt there, water, the water system. I love those fenders. Yeah, aren't they interesting? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's very swoopy, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, that is what they look like. Wow. Of course, they do get battered up after a while like that other engine had. In any case, that was this. This gives you a, a way. This this illustrates how you start with the general and then you go to the specific. And uh, like I said, Abdul, I don't read the commentaries that he puts in there because he had this long list of all these locomotives that were named uh, that he said were from Fitchburg Railroad and the Fitchburg Railroad listing that the Tabor has doesn't even have these locomotives listed. 
uh, as ever worked there, even though he has ones that are listed that says to U.S. military, to U.S. military, you know, so he keeps track of those, but uh, it just doesn't match up. Nobody knows for sure how many of these engines were working in Alexandria, but we know of at least two. Right. Okay. Um, Oh. On the spokes, those drivers' wheels in between are those counterweights for balancing the wheel? Because I've never seen them be different on one wheel and the other. Yeah, that's another thing that's different. If you go back to the photograph, uh, let's see, um, the drawing was it the drawing? No, one of them. There was a, a one where you could see the counterweights. I'm trying to see where. Maybe not in here. Somewhere I had a, a drawing, maybe a drawing. I think it was in white. Okay, that showed the counterweights being pie shaped, which is kind of like standardized uh, ones. Yeah, it's it's on white's drawing. Yeah, okay, it's on white, and this one just shows it as as slabs along the top. Okay, these these things are counterweights. So I don't know well, which I would go. I wouldn't necessarily go with a lithograph. Uh, if I have a photograph, because like again, again, it's it's all in the eye of the of the of the guy that that drew it. For example, every all the other engines seem to have those uh, on the steam dome seem to have these grooves. You know, probably a wooden, uh, probably wood uh, insulation around the steam dome. Interesting. And this one shows it as smooth, and uh, so that that changes things too. So yep. the the lithograph's good to get you a good idea because it shows. <laughs> the stack with its particularly high screen and things like that, but they're never perfect for some reason. I don't Dave, know. Can you, can you explain the cylinders up there? It looks like a V8. <laughs> yes, this is one of his very peculiar things. Now this being an inside uh, uh, connected engine, okay, obviously uh, the, the uh, steam chest, which is what this is, was where the valves are, would normally be uh, uh, rect uh, rectangular. Right. But for some reason, this guy developed a, some sort of system where his valves were like in a cir circular. I don't know what the inside looks like, it, but it doesn't have the same amount of space for uh, the shifting of the, 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 the uh, cylinder valves. So somehow or another, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is a characteristic of this guy manufacturer's locomotives, and uh, they all had them. And it made it unique. It made it easy to spot one of their engines because if it had this round thing, it was definitely a, a soother design. Oh. Those are steam chests. Yes. Right. Remember, the cylinders are on the inside. So this is on an angle so you have access to it. Okay. Uh, let me jump back to this other photograph, the front, the front photograph, that one. See, there are the cylinders very clearly together in the front. Damn. And so to get the, to, the, to the, the, sil the, the valves, you have to go in on an angle, okay? You can't come in horizontally and you certainly can't mount them on top of the cylinder. It has to be on the side. And 45 degrees was pretty typical if you look at the Hinkleys and all them other guys that had inside connected engines. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, working towards, uh, you know, a design. And uh, actually it was enough information and I was green lighting it and I actually sent them the first damn payment uh, before oh. the rug pulled out from under me. So I lost uh, nine grand on the design factor of this. Damn, brother. Well, you know, what the hell. Right. When you're that's, our, that's our politicians, you know. <laughs> that's a they're, they're famous for, for shitting on small businessmen. Well, you produced some great stuff though, Dave. I know, but I was planning to do even more. I had so much in the pipeline, it was ridiculous. So here, just hypothetically, money-wise, what would it cost to produce one today? Oh, <laughs> about 120. Okay. Used to run, most of my runs used to be about 85 grand. And uh, uh, that, would, that would get me a hundred pieces. Okay. So 150 today would still get you 100 pieces. Yeah, yeah. There's been some significant wow. increases in cost, um, but uh, mostly the paint. The paint 
cost almost uh, 30 percent plus of the, of the cost of locomotive if i wanted to do it pure brass i would have saved hundreds of dollars but you know that was my that was my uh, uh trademark almost you know it is <laughs> um, in any case though this would have made a great model i i was going to do this one uh this one was like i said already in advanced research it was uh i'd already green lighted to, to go to design i had the uh, uh I had a couple other engines. I had the, the uh, Baldwin flexible beam. That was already going to prototype. Uh, I had the, uh, uh, what was the other one besides flexible beam that I was going to do? Oh, what the hell? The camel? It's going. But in any case, I had, uh, uh, I lost a lot of money. Yeah, right. the, yeah, the grasshopper or something. Well, the grasshopper was a last ditch effort. I was fooled, however, uh, nobody in this country is capable of making a, a brass model. I thought I could get it done. I spent a lot of money getting a 3D uh, design done for the grasshopper, uh, including flying a team of people up to, uh, to Baltimore to uh, take direct measurements and to crawl underneath the, the existing model and figure everything out. And I had another guy go out to uh, the other surviving grasshopper out in Ohio, and he took lots of pictures interior. Wow underneath and around, mm -hmm. around and all of that. And it, it was would have made a really, really cool little model. Uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it was not possible to be, I, I basically wasted all what little money I had left. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have had somebody in, 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 uh, in Korea knock it out in no time flat, but they would have wanted more money. See, they're, they're, it's very funny out there. Um, they're going to charge you, you know, that, that hundred thousand dollars, no matter how many you order, it's still going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars. If you cut back on the uh, on the number of models, well, they just raise the price per model. So it always works out the same. Right. So that's why all of my runs tended to be with between the three rail and the two rails and the, and the any variations tended to run eighty to one hundred models. Right. And uh, that's just how it worked. Dave, how did you plan on doing the flexible beam uh, linkage? Oh, it's doing it exactly the way the, the Baldwin blueprint said so. I mean, there was going to be a, a certain amount of play uh, in, the, in, in kind of a, a snap-on kind of a, a joint on the uh, driving rods that allowed the flexible beam to move and, and the rods move with it. Because... I would have thought that probably in a model, you would have enough slack that you didn't really need to do that, you know, hemisphere. Oh, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. If it's, yeah. a, it's, a, if it's a ball and socket joint, if I'm gonna do a ball and socket joint, I'm gonna do a ball and socket joint. Oh, I know all about those now. <laughs> but basically, you know, there was, there was a, a joint there that, that allowed the flexible, the flexible beam didn't move that much. It moved. Yeah, 16, 64th of an inch, I think I read. What was that? Uh, I think they said it was only one sixty-fourth of an inch. Well, it was. Uh, I don't remember it being that little, but it was Google like it. that's on my blog. Like maybe maybe different models, but the 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 O eight O the front beam it moved. Uh, the, there was a diagram in the Baldwin uh, book uh, that Baldwin published years and years ago, uh, and it, it showed about a. Uh, was it about five or six degrees? Oh God, here we go. But in any case, uh, yeah, that one was, that was a nice engine. Those were all figured out. I had lots of orders. It was going to be great. But now, hey Dave, is that your last slide? What's that? Was that your last slide? No, I have uh, on oh, wet photography. If you want me to keep going. Ah, it's cool with me. Unless anybody's got questions. Okay. All right. Well, some of you saw this because I did this uh, on the trip to Memphis. I think it was. I showed you this thing, but there is oh, a yeah. uh, one third one thirty second is what I have on my blog. One thirty second. Yeah. Geeks, man, um, can't get rid of them. Let me let me dig around and I'll I'll, I'll send it, I'll send out a message on that. I've got a drawing and it's got to be more than one thirty second. I just don't have it off the top of my head simply because I recall it shifting, it shows how much it shifted. 132nd ain't gonna do it. Mm. That's just the amount of play you get on any standard side rod. 
in any case. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is all based on a this one uh, uh, paper uh, that was written by uh, this lady, Virginia Mencher, uh, called "The Mystery of Wet Plate Photography: F Photographs and Color." You can find this online. It's excellent. Okay. The key thing to remember is, of course, that it absorbs colors differently than than modern black and white, and you can't simply cannot compare those colors to uh, you know what a modern black and white will show. Uh, especially how it treats and blues, very, very different. And of course, the other advantage, of course, is due to the incredible depth of field you get due to the long exposures and the fact that it doesn't use uh, dots. It's a solid image. But to go directly to this, here are some pictures. The top is a wet plate, the middle is color, and the bottom is modern black and white. I want to call your attention to the green on the first one uh, on the left, turns out to be almost black. The red does turn out to be black. Blue looks gray, but yellow also looks black. So as a result, a wet plate is always going to be more black than anything else. Now, this is also true in fabrics. If you look at the style of fabric, look up there at the first, uh, the middle one, okay? looks like black and white with uh, paisley. But when you look at the color version, it's actually brown and cream. And if you look over here at the far side, uh, the middle one, you're gonna see that it looks like a um, dark color with uh, light dots, that this is probably either dark blue or black or something like that. Well, no, it's, it's actually red with green and there's three colors, different colors there, but it doesn't look like that. It looks like two colors up here. And so uh, this is a very common problem when you are trying to figure out colors. So how the hell do you figure out the colors? Well, usually what you do is you're going to have to find a description of the paint used. And I'll show you that in a minute, but let me just show you some more pictures of this about people. Okay. The top one is a wet plate. Bottom one is modern black and white. This other one is uh, color. This one's unusual in that the red is showing up as a, as a relatively light color, which is strange. But if you notice that the person in the center was wearing dark blue, it comes out looking relatively light over here. Okay. So it's, it's kind of, it, it's just, it just skews everything. You, you have a very difficult time determining colors. Complexions are also affected. Uh, the people color here are much lighter shade in color than they are in black and white. And if you notice pictures, you're all familiar with the pictures of Civil War soldiers sitting around and they all look very dark uh, uh, complexioned. And uh, you say, well, wait a second, you know, are these uh, black troops or are these foreigners or what, you know? Well, no, it's if they're sunburned or anything like that, it darkens their complexion. And over here is threads, and you can see that wet plate has a tendency to be lots and lots of dark. Look at that first stripe of colors. These are all greens and yellows. And here, the greens and yellows all come out black, 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 black. You can't even tell the difference. Okay. But last but not least, sometimes you get really, really lucky. There's nothing, there's nothing better than becoming really good friends with somebody that works in say a restoration shop at a, at a museum or works in the archives of a museum or anything like that, because then you get something like this. This is a genuine early 1870s list of colors by a commercial painter who produced paint for railroads. This has also got the color correction bar thrown in there. I was not permitted to even see the original of this. This is kept in a, in a, uh, a secure location with atmosphere control, et cetera, et cetera, but they gave me a copy of this. And here you can see some really key colors. Now, this will probably have to be adjusted by your screen, okay? Because it will look different depending on your monitor. That's what the purpose of the control color patches are. 
But uh, I like to look at that, for example, that car body color. That is your very typical cream color for uh, God knows how many passenger cars. Also usable for uh, box cars. But here are some of the other cool colors you see, the vermilion, uh, the, 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 uh, agenda, the lake, lake colors, the magenta lake and the new lake and the purple, which actually looks, doesn't look very purple at all, uh, things like that. And sometimes, you know, this is, this is the luck of the thing. There are other things that I found online, which has uh, various colors that are, are identified there online, uh, such as chrome green, which is a color that was used extensively by Rogers in those green uh, locomotives of theirs. Uh, there was another color, uh, another green shade that was also unusual known as Swedish green. And uh, those were very popular. And so uh, finding colors, your best bet is not to go buy a photograph, but to try to find the description and then match it up to a color because the photographs are going to deceive you. Our, our modern eyes are trained to see uh, shades of, of, of color that aren't there. So that is, that's the wrap. And I hope I didn't bore you. Hey Dave. Yes sir. Did you, did you post that, that last color chart some time ago? Seems like I've seen it before. I think I did. I know I talked about it before. I do. I did show that at the uh, at the uh, uh, Memphis meet that I went. Yeah, to. you sent me copies of that, and I got it in one of my books. You might have seen them in there, DC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was it was a wonderful thing to get my hands on. Oh, definitely. You know, you never know what they have. I mean, when I was working on the uh, the eighteen eighties uh, Pennsylvania Railroad varnish. Okay, they had these peculiar uh, uh, lighting system, uh, the, the frost carburetor light system, which works by burning gasoline in these wooden cars. Uh, they would, <laughs> if you can imagine that, they, they, they pumped, it pumped liquid gasoline up to the roof where it was mixed with air into uh, uh, gas fumes, and then it went down into the car, and then they lit it, and that was the lighting for the car. And <laughs> this was a safety, this was, important for safety. But the point was, is that I had photographs of, of these cars that had that, and I knew what the drawings looked like, but I was talking about it to these guys over in Pennsylvania one time, and they said, oh, a frost copper carburetor. Yeah, 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 come over here. And they go over, and I go follow them off into the back of the shop, and they, they go into this back room, and they open up this door, and there on the floor is a section of a roof, car roof, with the with the hood and everything on it from the carburetor system. So I was able to take measurements and figure out exactly where to put it and all that. And it was great. Likewise, they would let me in, you know, they have that older, uh, I think it's an mm, PF series car that's in rather sad shape in the, in the main hall there at the museum. And uh, you, you can't go in it or anything, but I got to go in it. It's just like uh, uh, settling the great argument about uh, American iron domes on uh, 1880s uh, engines. It was a big, big discussion. Uh, uh, what's his name was in on a Jim uh, Wilkie. Milky, he was discussing it. I was discussing it. The guy over in California was doing it. We were just exchanging emails saying, well, no, no, it couldn't be that. They're not able to work this, uh, this metal this way. Uh, it had to be cast. That's got to be paint. I said, it's not paint. It's, it's obviously a finish. Look at the way it gleams in the sun and every picture and blah, 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 blah. Well, I went over there and they, you know, they have that H3 engine. So we just simply climbed on top of the engine and smacked the, uh, oh, I used a rubber mallet. But we smacked <laughs> the mallet and lo and behold, it's hollow. So guess wow. what? It's sheet metal. Wow. Nothing like smacking into something with, you know, <laughs> with, a, with a rubber hammer. Yeah. yeah. But that was that, you know, that's some of the, the joy of getting to do stuff like this. And, 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 you know, like I said, you may not be able to get that right away, but if you do a rapport with a bunch of guys that do this professionally, you will get that kind of insider information. Right. Yeah. Hey, nice. what, what do you use for your formula on your chrome green? 
uh, for the Yona? Oh, the cone green. Uh, that's a, uh, I, I use a, I have the Pantone book, okay? And uh, I use Pantone shades. I can, uh, I can look that up and I can send you the Pantone number. Oh, that'd be great, okay. Yeah, you didn't even want it. All of the only way that you can communicate with these builders is you've got to be able to use, you know, you've got to use Pantone. They don't understand anything else. You can't name a shade. You just say, you point an arrow at the thing and you say, Pantone number such and such. Right. Right. I love it. That's great. If, if, they could, if they could screw it up, they will. Walter? Yeah, one thing I noticed, uh, I'm used to thinking of those front head, uh, headlamps being really a lot of filigree and decoration. And just about all the pictures we saw, the ones you had, they were pretty plain. Is there any kind oh. of thing like passengers or fancier than freight or, or a builder did more than another builder or what? Let me mention something about that. Um, a lot of the times you'll look at especially uh, the pictures of Civil War uh, engines and stuff, the tenders look blank. How many times you've seen that? Blank tender time. markings. Well, uh, we got into it. I got into a discussion with that too. I should get a hold of that famous uh, uh, picture of the double, uh, the double water tower over there in... Uh, in uh, 30 point or Union? 30 point, point. Yeah, 30 point. 30 point. Robinson is sitting at the double tender, at the double water tank. Yeah. Well, the Robinson used to be the hopped, okay? But it looks like the tender is blank. But if you get the highest resolution TIFF file out of the National Archives and zoom right into it, you will see the lettering is still the hop style U.S. military railroads on it. The reason I believe that's the case is because of the varnish that they put on it. The varnish is very reflective and so the, the camera does not pick up what's under the varnish. It picks up the reflection of light. And so the tender looks flat. And uh, is, that makes sense. Because they always mark the tenders and they always painted them up. And so uh, there's no reason why it would be blank. That's great. That's a new one. Yeah, yeah I was yeah, always wondering about that. It's like, yeah. go ahead, what? So same principle on the headlamps you're thinking? Well, that's what I'm thinking, that the headlamp would be the same way too, because uh, when you see a lot of engines that are side view engines and pretty decent light, you will you will see, especially when they're clean, you're going to see that there is decoration on the headlamps. And then later on, you see that there, there's less decoration or there is no decoration. Well, I don't think the decoration is gone. I just think it's either coated with, it's got dirt on it or it's the reflectivity is, is off or something like that. Uh, because it, everybody seems to have decorated hand lamps, at least pinstripes and stuff. Would you concur with that, Mr. Ott? Right? That sounds about right. In terms of decorative headlamps? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it all makes perfect sense to me. Um, I think what Walter was talking about, though, um, are the simple uh, wireframe um, headlamp mounts, uh, like you see on 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 the on the models of the, of the General of Texas, is that, what you, what, is that what you were talking about, Walter? But the the actual sheet metal on the sides of the lamps. Oh, oh okay, yeah, and, and, and the and scroll was, work. Yeah, no, I, I I fully agree. You know, it's it, it sounds logical to me that uh, stuff like the varnish. Especially varnish after it's been there a couple of years in the sun, uh, probably just takes over the whole thing. Got it. Cool. Good. Thank you, David. Thank well, you. You're most Very welcome. informative. Thank Excellent. you. If anybody wants to donate a couple hundred grand, I can start making locomotives. Okay, baby. As soon as they hit the lottery, that's what's happening. You got. You got hey, I've been trying. I've been trying the lottery route forever. Doesn't Don't seem quit. to never, You never know. Shots I got a scratch. I had a scratch off today. I won a dollar. Plus there you me. go. See, there's hope. But so you only need 199. <laughs> is yeah, it really a money issue? Two dollars for the ticket. I only got his dollar for it. Bernie, money again. Dave, Dave, my question is: Is it really a money issue, or are there other problems that you? I remember you talked to me about it, and it sounded like it was more than just money. 
there were some problems that were cropping up, but I managed to over, at the, toward the end, I managed to overcome all of them. They were, uh, what was happening was uh, the builders were getting more and more upset about my demands for, uh, for uh, accuracy, tail and stuff like that. And so they wanted to keep, I was fighting with them over price is what it was. And if you notice, my stuff got a lot more expensive as time went on. Well, yeah. we're demanding more and more money the, the, for it, but I was beating them down on that because I knew it was all blowing smoke, especially something like the grasshopper. God, the grasshopper has almost no decoration. It's painted black and green with a, with a, with a, with a copper smokestack. That's real tough. Well, after seeing your presentation tonight, I want one of those Sother motors logos. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're well, you're the guy to do it too. You can scratch build pretty much anything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was another question. Uh, what? Why does the leech? Are you familiar with the engine leech? The leech it has three steam domes on it, or three domes. Let me read it. Yeah, that's that's not all that uncommon. Is it? Okay. Domes. Uh, that I think Leach was a Baldwin, wasn't it? John? Uh, New Jersey. It, it was a New Jersey engine. New Jersey, yeah. New Jersey John, engine. John okay. Help me. Uh, yeah, the the secondary steam dome was at one point they they started using them for certain engines. They thought that this would allow the steam to be cleaner uh, because of the muddy uh, water in it. You know, stuff like that. That's what I heard. Uh, but I do know that Baldwin made several of them. I know Rogers made some. Of course, the General okay. is a three dome engine. I, just, I was just wondering about that. Yeah, it, that's what that was. What was explained to me because I did ask why? Why do they have these extra? Actually, it'd be two steam domes, and of course, the sand domes doesn't matter. Uh, the front dome was for the throttle, and then the rear dome by the cab was for the safety valves, so that the levers from the safety valves would reach over into the cab. Okay. Had the springs for the safety valves inside the cab where they could be adjusted. But wasn't it wasn't it also to to make to give a greater supply of relative steam? Oh yeah, yeah. That, that was that was a theory in the fifties that the yeah. dry steam was forward in the boiler. Yeah. Uh, away from the firebox where they thought that all the boiling was happening. Right. Okay. You know, yeah. That, that's that's what I, that's what I had heard about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they thought all the they thought all the dry steam was up at the front. Yeah, and then, cool. you know, guys like Mason and uh, uh, Eddie and all the all, all the other builders, and they they proved them wrong. Right. It sounds good though. I mean, you know, after all, that's where things bubbling away. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it looks pretty cool too. It looks different. That's the neat thing about it. Yes, yes, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, thing to do. I, I, I've got, as, as time went on, I became more and more interested in, in, in otter designs. Like I said, I really wanted to do an inside connected. I thought that'd be really cool to see the, the moving parts underneath like that. And, uh, yeah, that would be cool. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, more, I'm more yeah, If we could figure out a way to do a crank axle. Uh, you know those guys can make anything you want they'll they'll do it the crank axle itself it's a dummy anyway it's just going to be like a bi little bicycle thing there and you know it'll just the, the, the drive will still go down the way you know to the back axle like usual that's what i was doing at the end there i had the motor horizontal in the boiler yeah that's the this one. gear tower going through the firebox where it connected to the rear axle, which drove everything, which that's how I managed to get all the eccentrics to be able to be movable because there was no, they were just loose parts. You know, there was no pressure on them to, to do any drive. The drive was on the back wheels. But they, may, they are remarkable models, Dave. They really are amazing. Thank you. Yeah, they were the only thing that would have tempted me to get into O scale. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was, it was a nice run. It was what uh, started at 03 and I lasted till 14, 12 years. And uh, it didn't stop because I stopped, stopped because I got my financing cut off. So, 
Yeah. Well, I, I I have a sister engine to the Yona uh, in Memphis. Dave took an Amenia and uh, turned it into the Lookout, mm -hmm. uh, which was the last locomotive to escape from Huntsville uh, when old Mitch came down the road. Yeah, you know, y'all remember the the movie, but it, when old Mitch came down, uh, anyway the uh, the lookout was the last uh, train to escape, and it's and they are incredible models. I mean, to watch that uh, valve mechanism underneath is just beautiful, just beautiful. And this this is my version of the Yona, which is the Osceola. Can you hold and it up a little, Bernie? A little higher. Okay, thank you. So it looks thank like the Amenia, but it's uh, been relettered. We had no photos. Uh, Dave custom had them custom paint this for me. And yeah, I was um, able to do that for a re very reasonable cost too. Uh, yeah, it wasn't much. I, I recall it was, it was almost nothing. It was 50 Maybe. bucks, I think. And uh, the only drawback to this Loco is it doesn't really pull very much. No, the motor is really small. It's tiny, yeah. The little Swiss motor I had to get, because to get it to fit in the boiler, the diameter had to be small, so unfortunately. Well, but if you have, if you're pulling some wood rolling stock or something like that, with some of those cars you made out of wood, uh, it should be able to pull, you know, half a dozen cars. Maybe it pulls four. Four, okay. I got it to do yeah. four, and it has a soundtracks in there with a um, little sugar cube, and it really it runs great. It has keep alive, and it has the soundtracks with the sugar cube. Sounds mm. great. Mm. It just uh, it can't pull a big train. So this is my general special when we operate. So there wherever the commander is, this stays in steam. And every now and then we run it as an extra and everything else stops while it runs. Oh, cool. That's cool. I, did we do that when you guys were here? Hmm. I don't think so. No. Okay, well, several that's, crews that's, what, running. that's what I do with it now. So if I get like an odd number of operators, one guy can run the special at some point. That's cool. And I, I do have a message that says they did this. So it's not like I made this up. <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> Yeah, it could also be. Oh, I have a question for you guys. One question, Charlie. No, Charlie I was wanted, looking at the, the. Charlie wanted to ask some one question first, Dave. Hang on a second. No, no, uh, Dave, please, please. Oh, okay. Okay, one of the engines Sorry, I was thinking about was so well. interesting, and there was that good photograph. Was the General Grant or the one that you see at City Point? Uh, the thing is, is I ran into another photograph of of that engine that was sitting on a barge supposedly uh, uh, a couple of years earlier, so the question I had was if anybody knew that General Grant was named after somebody else prior to being named the General Grant, but it still has all the same decorations. So it could also be a possible uh, misidentified photograph. It might actually be another city point dock type photograph because it's on, it's on a barge. Mm -hmm. Anybody familiar with that picture? Bernie, if I send that to you, or John, you guys might want to look, take a look at it. Sure. Yeah, we, we did run into that photo and we, uh, it, it was, it's the grant as far as we're concerned. Yeah, uh, but see that the problem is the identification on it indicates uh, like eight, you know, it's like 1862-ish. So it yeah. can't, you know, so that's probably another misidentified, you know, photograph, which are a dime a dozen. Yeah, you know, we we could we couldn't um, figure out, or you know, it was just kind of beyond believability that they'd have the identical paint job on the on the tender. Exactly, that's what I that was what my feeling was that the it's a misidentified photograph. But that, that that was taken at White House, wasn't it? Wasn't it taken uh, out at White House Landing? Yeah, I think that's what they said it was White House Landing. Mm -hmm. And they did reactivate that line during uh, Grant's wilderness campaign. Yeah, yeah, but it could also have been originally named the George B. McClellan or something, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very short lived line. Yes, well, it was a short lived campaign. <laughs> well, yeah, Grant did not like relying on the railroads until he got to City Point. He wanted to stay close to the shore and use boats. Yeah, well, boats are less inclined to be raided by cavalry. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, when they rebuilt the Aquia Line Bridge over the Potomac Creek grant, they only use it for nine days and then they abandoned it. And they just use it to evacuate the wounded from the wilderness for the most part. Oh. Uh, your, your tax dollars to work. Sounds <laughs> army to me. Yeah. Got it. Good. Cool. Dave, Dave does a great job of that fabulous yeah. presentation. Yeah. Well yeah. done, man. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank it you, was really good. Appreciate you all. Thanks, so, Dave. A moment, a moment of, uh, of personal uh, advertisement here. Uh, you know, I, I created a kit of the uh, Confederate uh, Lee, uh, the Lee car, okay? And uh, I still have some of them sitting around in, box, in, in <coughs> boxes and stuff. And uh, I have them both HO and O gauge. If anybody's interested in one, get a hold of me. I'll make you a deal that you can't refuse. And if you refuse, well, I, I guess I won't sell it to you. <laughs> I have one. I have one. I know I've is sold this, them. They're nice kids. Is this what you're talking about, Dave? The Lee gun. Yeah. Mm. This is uh, this is G scale. Yeah, I did it in in O and H O, and uh, it was real nice. It, it's a lot of brass parts, and it got it caught. The brass parts cost more than everything put together, but I mean, oh. it, all all the wheels are all all pre mounted, and they got the inside bearings and stuff. You just got to stick them into the wood. <clears throat> Even I can build the kit, and I'm not a big kilt builder. But if you're interested, I'll send you more information. Well, cool. send me an email. If anybody is going to be in Pennsylvania on May 1st at Columbia, Pennsylvania, they're doing a Civil War um, Railroad Day. Hmm. Uh, and um, what's the name's going to be up there? Oh, shoot, I forgot his name. The guy wrote all the books about the Pennsylvania Railroads in the Civil War. He used to do war gaming. Scott, uh, anyway, he'll be giving a talk. I'll be doing some talks, and there's some other people that'll be doing talks. So it's Columbia, Pennsylvania on May 1st. What is the event called? I, I don't know. I'll put it on my blog. It's something called, like, Columbia Railroad Days. Okay. Uh, it was supposed to be last year, it got canceled. This year, it's going to be a real live in person uh, event. Neat. So, I wish I could remember Scott's last name now. It's it. Scott Mingus. Burns. Mingus, that's All right. it. Yeah. Mingus, yes. Yeah, because Joe used to war game with him, right? Yeah, I know him well. He used to do a lot of Johnny Reb, but now he's a book writer and he goes around the country promoting his books. Yeah, he, he also uh, did one on Hanover. He did a when we, when we went to Hanover Junction, he also did the monograph that they have there on the history of the uh, the junction in the Civil War. I have his book on that, yeah. So anyway, I actually did uh, knew him from Wargaming Days and did photos for one of his books for Antietam, I think it was. Or maybe it was Gettysburg. No, it was Gettysburg. No, it was both. It was Gettysburg and Antietam. You have credit in a couple of his books for the figures. And the yeah, they were scenario booklets, so... Yeah. Oh. Anyway, so should yeah. I wear my uniform? Oh yeah, I bring it with of you at course. least. Absolutely. You if I still fit in it. Wear it. <laughs> I may have gotten too big. <laughs> hey, John. Take care. Okay. Thank you, John. John. Bye, Dave. All right, I got to get going too. It was great talking Good to you. Good night, guys. all. You know, it's like uh, old home day, you know, because I, I, I know quite a few of you, and those of you I don't know yet, uh, I'll get to know you. Yeah. been a long time since I've been in with this group, uh, you know, back in the olden days. Yep. Yep. Back yep. When, uh, a long, long time. We've got two we new members up. today. Yeah. yeah. That's what? So I just finished my semester. I just finished uh, two more. Classes. I'm, all, I'm gonna have summer vacay. Of course, they don't pay me for summer vacay, but uh, Lisa gives me some free time. Yeah, good, good. Uh, all I, right. I, teach, I teach history to do a, at a junior college level, and I'm telling you, well, these guys don't know anything. <laughs> oh my God, it's terrible. 
I mean, I even get to the point where I'm getting up into the 1980s and stuff like that. And I mentioned uh, they have no clue. I mentioned Jimmy Carter and they say, who's he? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm serious. They, I'm they, don't, sure. they don't know who he is. Hardly Youngsters. know who Reagan is. Youngsters. Yeah. The, the, the collective memory is only only about 15 to 20 years back. And then they don't know anything. Wow. No, that, lack of perspective. that. That comes with age. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I got a nephew who was taught about the Beatles in history class. I like <laughs> history. I, anyway. Oh well. well. Kind of there. It's, it's a stretch, <laughs> but you know, depends on the teacher. <laughs> no, no. I, I have a trivia question for you. It's not necessarily Civil War, although they did have an action in the Civil War. What country? is the first country to recognize the United States and still honors the treaty that they signed. Thought it was France, was it not? It's not France. No, no, oh, no, no. Is it oh. Holland? Netherlands. Holland. Was it? Holland. It's uh, not Holland. It's not a European country. Hint. Nobody says no. Netherlands. Canada? No. No, that was British. That was a British colony. And the well, I, don't, I don't know that one. I guess I'll have to turn in my degree. <laughs> anyway, the, the answer is Morocco. And the, and the Civil War oh, tie-in well. is that there was a lot of spying and shenanigans going on in Morocco during the Civil War. That guy Seams was there for a while. and Some, uh, yeah. But anyway, Morocco recognized us very early. It's first country to ever do it. And they're still alive with us. And we, we looked out for them and made sure they became independent after World War II. Interesting. So That's who would have cool. guessed? Well, Our longest I'm, I'm, ally I'm, is a Muslim country. A friend of mine said they saw this really good presentation. They said you cannot understand the beginnings of the Civil War if you don't know the history of France. And I haven't heard the talk, but I found that intriguing. If you heard any documentary or lecture on what France had to do with the beginning of the American Civil War? Not a thing. No, but it makes an interesting conversation. I have a friend of mine who spent hours reading through the founders documents and his claim was the grounds for the Civil War were written during the Constitution era. So yeah. when they that the grounds for the Civil War were actually laid during the uh, Constitution Convention and the rules that were put in place. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. of, of the Oh, well, guess where the uh, when was the first Secession conference ever held, and what states were thinking about seceding? Massachusetts. Are you talking and, about the uh, uh, War of it was Massachusetts. It was the War of eighteen twelve, and, 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 and the, the North New England colonies wanted to secede, and I think it was John Adams talked to me just sticking around. Yeah, well, actually, that's what I say. Massachusetts yeah, wanted to secede within Convention. five years. Yeah. Have you guys heard about a little something called the Whiskey Rebellion in Western mm -hmm. Pennsylvania? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, George Washington, that, president, uh, personal command of the Pennsylvania militia to march on the, the Whiskey Rebellion. Right, right. Yes, the only time an active president was act actively campaigning. Well, but he yeah, did not come on the fire. Can't count James Madison, and although he was on the field at Bladensburg, he just sort of sat there on his horse and then ran off with the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> Hey, Dave, I appreciate this. This was very informative. Thank you very much. I've got to call it a night. Um, I've been sitting in front of this computer since nine o'clock this morning, so I got to do something. I got to get into a more comfy chair. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you, George. Thank you, George. By yeah, the way, I was going to say, those of you guys who I didn't get a chance to thank John publicly, but I've got that. I've got set of decals now for this general that I'm working on. So these oh. will be printed off here in a little bit. Awesome. We'll look forward all to right. seeing that presentation. So, all right, guys. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night. Bye, Bye George. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. I still have papers to grade. My semester's not over with, so yeah. nice job. Thank you. Tally ho, Ron. Okay. Good night, all. Bye, Joel. Good night. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Thank good you, night all. Good night, all.